And I'd like to thank you all for attending our webcast today, how facilities maintenance teams can save time installing and maintaining bottle fillers. Our presenter today is Scott Nielsen, Director of Filtration for Zern LK. Scott has been with Zern uh, with that organization for 11 years and recently began his new role as leader of the filtration business to bring cleaner, safer drinking water to all of his customers and users. His focus currently spans everything from marketing and awareness campaigns to building out strategic sales channels to new innovative filtration techno technologies for Zern LK's drinking water platforms. We have a couple of learning objectives for today as well. We're gonna review the challenges and requirements within K-12 and higher ed environments, understand current problems that FMs currently deal with relative to drinking water, bottle fillers, water coolers, and filters. We're gonna learn how new designs can simplify installation and reduce maintenance time. And finally, we'll understand those negative effects new drinking water pollutants such as PFAS uh, can cause, and then the certified solutions that are available today to help mitigate. So before Scott gets underway, I'd like to cover a few more house, uh, housekeeping details. We encourage audience questions throughout the webcast. To submit those questions, you can just navigate your mouse to that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, type in your questions at any time. We'll hold most of the questions to the conclusion. We'll get to as many as time permits. And as we do wrap up today's webcast, you will receive a copy of the presentation slides in PDF format. In that email, you'll also see a link to a brief online assessment. And upon the successful completion of that assessment, you'll receive a CEU certificate as well. And finally, if you'd like to revisit any of the points Scott's about to cover today, you can go to facilitiesnet.com slash webcasts, where this presentation will be archived within a day or two. I'm all done and it's time to pass it over to Scott. Great, thank you, Wendy. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. As, as Wendy mentioned, my name is Scott Nielsen. And I'm the Director of Filtration um, at, at Zern LK. And in that role, um, you know, really kind of focus on making sure we're providing the cleanest and safest drinking water possible through all different types of our um, uh, fixtures and dispensers. Um, I think as we go through the presentation today, you know, obviously titled Save Time and Money, um, I think that gets everyone's attention. But I think the three big themes we've, we're seeing within the market right now that you're probably experiencing are, you know, people caring more about hydration, people caring more about sustainability, and keep people caring more about water quality. And we'll touch on all three of those. But basically, what that means is it's putting more burden on, on you all um, to make sure that bottle fillers are present, hydration's available. It's doing so in a sustainable way, but it's delivering high quality, um, clean, safe drinking water. Um, we'll go through all the solutions we have to make that easier. There's a lot of things in here that makes your job easier. Um, less maintenance, easier maintenance, lower cost. We can cover that all. So um, that's sort of the gist of it. If we sort of you know look at, again, what, what we'll talk about, drinking water challenges, right? So, so there are some that exists right now. And there's some um, developments happening within everything I just talked about in terms of just water quality, conservation, sustainability, um, the, the push for hydration, why the market is what it is, um, existing bottle full of challenges. So I'm sure you all have, you know, a list that that you have um, in terms of the challenges you face. You know, we've identified a lot of those and we have solutions that we're implementing to uh, to tackle those and to really work hand in hand to uh, to make to make your job easier. Um, we'll go through what those solutions are, some new stuff, some existing stuff, but really co cover comprehensively our portfolio and what can help. And then, you know, how we think about building specs and and what we have differentiated um, and, and the improvements in the market holistically that allow for better specifications of things that will help um, in, in your roles and then collaboration opportunities. Um, so if we kind of take a step back, right, you know, we've seen this push to bottle fillers really in the last 20 years. It feels like they've been around forever, but but they haven't. It's sort of been um, a more recent um, kind of, uh, you know, market and, and shift. Um, you see them all over, right? And I think with COVID and the hygienic touchless um, change, they accelerated more often. And we're seeing quite an acceleration of the conversion from bubblers, drinking fountains to those uh, bottle fillers. And we have a lot of solutions that kind of retrofit and, and put those together for people that want those. But I think it's really an expectation that these days is I have a bottle, more people are carrying around, more people want hydration, more people want easy fill up with clean water. 
Um, and, and that's kind of where we see the market going. Um, and, and, you know, sustainability waste reduction continues to be a large focus for many people. Um, being able to fill that up quickly, being able to save a lot of single use plastic bottles, um, ESG sustainability continues to be a push, which this addresses sort of head on with some of the market and some of the stuff that we've seen historically with, with single use plastic bottles. Um, and just the statistics, you know, today there's about 130,000 K-12 schools, 6,000 colleges, universities, which means there's about 70 million students um, and individuals within these markets. And so the demand is high, the opportunity is big to really deliver our, you know, the, the right solutions and the right um, hydration options to them. So if we take a step back and we can talk about water quality a little bit and kind of where we are and what's coming with water quality as we get into the products, you know, today there's still 47 million children being exposed to lead in their school drinking water. It's more than one in every two. Um, that's, you know, ridiculous considering that we have solutions that are efficient, effective, economical. It costs about a dollar per student for an entire school year to provide them safe, clean drinking water. Um, so I think that's sort of been the historic um, thing we've always tackled is lead. And lead is, you know, very important. Lead is still a problem. It's, it's really the core at which, uh, you know, historically water quality has, has gravitated towards. And most of the filters and the water stuff we all deal with, we think about lead reduction and, and, and lead free drinking water as sort of the primary thing we're solving. That's sort of been the last 10, 20 years, the focus. Um, why is that? there's no safe levels of lead in water. Um, lead affects everyone, but it particularly affects children that are still developing. And what it does is it affects um, nervous system development, brain development, behavioral issues. It can lead to learning disabilities. You're interfering a lot of the mechanics within the building, within the body, um, especially during development. It, it kind of alters them in some um, irreversible ways of having that interference. So keeping lead out of uh, especially younger individuals is, is really critical in their development. Um, unfortunately, there's a new thing coming called PFAS. This is going to be worse than lead. Um, and we're just starting to see it and it's gonna happen for the next you know, several decades at least. And I'll explain why that is. But, but PFAS is synonymous with forever chemicals. So if you've heard forever chemicals or PFAS, same thing, what it is, it's a family of synthetic chemicals that industries have made for decades for different consumer and industrial products. Um, one great example is the nonstick frying pan cookware you, you, you used to have, right? There was a Teflon coating on there that was great because it never went away. It always performed. It was heat resistant, scrape resistant, you know, dishwasher, all this stuff. But the great thing is it never went away. The bad thing is it never went away. And so that frying pan gets thrown out and it eventually disintegrates. That chemicals and that lining is designed to never break down, to never um, kind of dissolve. It always stays intact. So eventually that leaches into the drinking water. And now it's getting into people where, again, it doesn't break down and it doesn't um, pass through. And again, more interference within your body with these chemicals. Um, you can kind of see a few different ways it gets in. You know, we talked about landfills. And the reason I say decades to come is because we're just sort of on the tip of the sphere, the spear of it leaching into the drinking water. Even if we stopped putting PFAS in stuff today, which we sort of have, but we haven't, um, there's still 20, 30 years of backlog in that landfill that's still coming down that we're not going to take all that stuff out. So this will be a, a continuation of a problem. Um, as PFAS from historical decades is still on its way down into groundwater um, and filtering it is challenging. We have a filter that does it. You can put in any LK device, any LK bottle filler, drinking fountain, faucet that does PFAS, but it is challenging. We'll talk about why that is. And so municipalities will eventually deal with this, but it's going to cost billions of dollars and it will take decades. We have solution that does this today that is effectively against what's coming with this PFAS. Um, why is PFAS an issue? The health effects of PFAS are worse than lead. So it's been directly associated with different types of cancers, um, immune system issues, reproductive issues, again, targeting children with developmental 
problems, hormonal issues, cholesterol, obesity. Again, you're putting something in, in your bodies that's not designed to be there, that doesn't break down, that doesn't pass, and it causes havoc in some ways. Um, there was a pretty widely disseminated study about a year ago from the United States Geological Survey that about half of the nation's tap water has PFAS in it now. Um, you can see some of these headlines from the USA Today, from the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. It's affecting 46 million systems served. Nearly half of the tap water contains it. It's everywhere. What are we doing? Um, so we know that the effect is real and this is kind of coming. Um, if you go back a slide and actually look at this map of where PFAS has been found so far, it, it, today it's probably fully saturated because what we've heard is it's been found at the North Pole, in Antarctica, and on Mount Everest. So if it's those three places, it's likely spread um, kind of throughout the world, unfortunately, as it goes through air, through water, um, at different types of rain brings it when it goes up in the air, comes back down. So even if you're not around these sites, these landfills, these uh, airports, these military bases, um, just just clouds uh, you know, moving around is bringing it kind of everywhere it, it gets to. Um, and then the third, you know, fun, <laughs> I feel like the, the person bringing all the good news. Um, you know, the, the third thing that just came up recently is microplastics, right? And so there was a study that came out at the beginning of the year that basically said within bottled water, uh, bottled water, a liter of it may contain up to 400,000 pieces of microplastic. So now we're thinking within the bottled water industry, um, it's been shown that there is uh, there is a um, ability to, to produce or to put microplastics into that water, particularly, and it, it is without outside of bottled water as well. Um, but that's sort of where concentrations exist. Again, our filters effectively and are certified um, for microplastic reduction as well. So we're sort of taking all of this, you know, news um, out of water to provide that clean hydration that everyone seeks. And there's really not a safe place else to go, even with bottled water um, or tap water, um, unfortunately. It, if we look at kind of where the effect is in this country, it, it's everywhere. And so this map basically is grading uh, states on how their drinking water quality is in schools. Uh, more than half of those are Fs with a couple of Cs and, and a lot of Ds, right? So everybody is you know, um, a bit able to improve. There's not a city, city, a region, a territory that's immune from kind of what we just all talked about. There's improvement that can come everywhere. Um, and it's happening. And we'll talk about that in the next few slides. And you can just see some of the headlines, you know, not to be read, but just, you know, it's popping up more and more. There's more awareness around it. There's more, um, you know, investigation, testing around it. And so we're, we're caring more and more about it, which is why a lot of our customers and what we're seeing is a higher demand for, hygienic, sustainable, clean uh, water uh, options within uh, all these facilities and schools. Um, there is a lot of legislation coming. So, so everything I just said, people know, right? They know it's not that expensive to do this. It's effective. Um, and there's a lot of kind of bad things coming in the water that affects people that we're starting to learn about. So uh, Michigan just passed something called Filter First which requires every K-12 school and every daycare in the state to basically filter every single potable water source in that building. So when we talk about beyond bottle fillers, food prep sinks, classroom sinks, you know, everything needs to be filtered, monitored, maintained, and tested. So they've made it pretty bulletproof that that has to all happen. Um, Pennsylvania, California are coming. You look at some of these other um, states um, Colorado, the Clean Water in Schools, the California Safe Drinking Water Assembly Bill, the Healthy and Safe School Waterhouse Plan, the Safe Drinking Water in Schools to get the lead out. They, they're all saying the same thing, right? Which is we want to provide clean water in our schools and we can do that. But yet 46 million children today still are being exposed to it. So this sort of bridges it and it's coming. You look at some of these bills, these are all introduced, you know, within the last year or so. So this is all new and it's happening quickly. Um, Michigan sort of passed and signed into law this gold standard of bills. We see a lot of states kind of following that track and catching up. So um, a lot of this regulation is, is coming as well. We also see a lot of advocacy on the rise. You know, we talked about 
you know, the importance of this and what people are seeing, we also see a lot of advocacy, you know, around this and social awareness and demand. So, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was drink from a hose, you know, who cares? It's all good. You know, whether we like it or not, there's now a societal expectation you know, for clean water and people care about what they put in their bodies and there's social media now that they're talking about it and, and, and making, you know, and, and demanding change and everything. So, you know, between legislation, advocacy, social awareness, you know, we see a lot of change coming around the lead, the PFAS, the microplastics and all the, uh, the issues we're talking about with healthy, sustainable hydration, um, which is really the goal for us all, I believe. Um, you know, we think about kind of who we influence and, you know, where we kind of fit in here. So, you know, obviously purchasing has a say in this, right? They're the ones that kind of do all the sourcing, the procurement of, of, of both uh, maintenance and, and new units. Um, facilities folks, obviously, um, you all overseeing kind of that maintenance and making sure it's functioning as it should. Um, sustainability ESG departments. We talk a lot with sustainable and ESG departments about meeting their goals, right, of being less of a of impact on the environment and offering more sustainable solutions within the facility. I mean, they like the idea of saving billions and billions of single use plastic bottles and doing so in a very efficient way and then building users, right? Again, wanting hydration, what, liking sustainability and caring about kind of the water quality they're consuming. Um, you know, obviously focused on facilities, the ones that install service, you know, maintain the bottle fillers. This is kind of where we've put a lot of time and effort in making sure it becomes easier, it becomes more intuitive and there's less problems because we know this market's growing. We know this market is gonna continue to um, serve, you know, in this purpose of, of, of offering this. And, and, you know, how do we make that easier and how do we make it, um, you know, less stressful um, to provide that all? Um, you know, so, so we think about some of the, you know, drinking water challenges that, that are faced today, and we'll go into solutions for this, but, you know, hot surface temps and drinking water solutions, particularly outside, you know, units to the south, a lot of schools might be open air with units mounted outside the classroom, um, sort of on an outside wall. You know, those are stainless steel, they're in the sun, they get very hot, they can be dangerous. Um, vandalism, I probably don't have to tell you, I talk to a lot of schools and even I'm shocked at the uh, the amount of different things the the kids are kids are doing. I have a, a five and a seven year old, so they're not quite in there yet. But I, I'll keep I'll keep an eye on them pretty carefully to make sure uh, they're not involved in any of the TikTok stuff or the things we hear about. That's just a little bit mind blowing. But but it is something that we're aware of, right? Whether it's you know, we can joke about it, but it's happening, and we need to address it. And so we're providing better solutions to mitigate some of that. Um, historical quality issues, you know, as we think about going from bubblers to bottle fillers and retrofits may not have always worked hand in hand and seamless. We have better solutions now to upgrade, to change, to kind of make sure that we're getting to that, that kind of end goal, um, as in the most quality way possible, um, difficult to retrofit, you know, kind of talked about that. And then, you know, poor user experience around, you know, not cold enough water, not good tasting enough water, flow rates, different things. Again, um, a lot of the things that we're addressing have solutions for. So, you know, I think as we kind of balance the act about what works for, for you all in terms of um, ease of maintenance, uptime, long lasting and budget procurement, we know it's a bit of an arm wrestle. Um, we've sort of kind of balanced that to come up with solutions that, uh, you know, are value propositions that save time and money over the long term with less labor and, and be able to do your job easier. So that's certainly in our minds as we develop products of kind of the balance between the two. Um, and so just going through, you know, some of our solutions, you know, uh, we, we kind of look at against balancing, you know, the cost and the maintenance with the ease of, you know, installing and maintaining. And I think we've come up with a lot of good solutions to from new to retrofit to ongoing that kind of balances that. Um, we start with our, this is sort of our top of the line bottle filler. It's our new enhanced P model filtered bottle filler. So this is as good as it gets with, from, from LK. Um, a couple new things on this. Number one, we have now a quick drop down uh, filter change. And, and, and in a few slides, I'm going to show you the three side by side by side filter change experiences you can, you can uh, go through. You probably all know the existing one, but we've gotten two better ones. 
This provides two screws at the very top. So you don't have to go underneath anymore. You don't have to get on your back. This drops down, you turn the filter and you pop it back up. Um, this takes, it took me 39 seconds from beginning to end of the entire filter change process. And this comes with an automatic light reset. Moment that filter changes, the light changes, you don't have to go to a second part in this and dig around for any resets. You just change the filter. The other thing is we have a 6,000 gallon filter that's double the capacity of really the good ones today. Most good filters are 3,000, a lot are 1,500. We have a 6,000 gallon filter. So that now comes standard in this P unit. So we've now said we're gonna go from a, a burdensome process to change the filter every 3,000 gallons to one quick one every 6,000. Again, saving time on the maintenance, saving money. That actually does save money on, on filtration over time, which we'll go through as well. Um, you think about that enhanced model, a lot of good features here. Automatic status light reset. Um, how that works is basically on the back of our filters, there's RFID tags. So if I peel this off, you can see underneath here, there's actually a chip on our filter. The moment this filter goes in to that, this P unit, it will read that filter, it will identify its capacity, and it will change the light automatically. It clicks in, light goes green. This is a 6,000 gallon filter. Now it knows from that chip, it's 6,000 gallons. That light stays on for 6,000 gallons green. Um, so this is a very kind of smart in a way units with some electronics that make this the best to maintain. Um, faster filter changes. Um, and again, you know, hands-free operation, different features here. Um, the nice thing about this is we have bezel plates with this as well, that no matter the openings you currently have, if you're going to take units off and put this on, we have the bezel plates that covers the whole area that just has the openings for where the openings on, on these enhanced units are needed, either single or bi-level. So this is the big advantage to switching these out is you don't have to do a lot of patching and reopening. This goes behind it to make that installation pretty seamless. Um, you know, we talked about a bit of this. You, you'll see in a minute the old school way of changing filters versus now the drop down, um, the filter reset automatically, the bezel plate for faster installation, you know, one filter brand. We'll talk about that, but basically our filters are universal across everything that says LK. If it's an LK filter and it's an LK device, it fits. We have one universal head, one universal um, top. Everything is compatible with everything. So you really only need one SKU for everything we'll talk about in terms of filtration, um, fewer filter changes. And we do have that PFAS filter that we'll go through. Now, you might say, hey, Scott, that drop down is great. I have a bunch of units. I'm not buying a new one, right? We just bought it. We now have also side access retrofits for um, our existing units that are installed. We can't provide the drop down as a retrofit because of the way the chassis is worked as engineered that. What we can do is sell you basically a new uh, shroud or a wrapper with the side access panel and it comes with a filter. It's really not that expensive when you think about you get a filter with it. So what we tell people is next time you're gonna change the filter, Get this filter maintenance kit, take that shroud off, throw it away, put the new filter in, put the new shroud on. Now, every single subsequent time, you're going to be able to change that filter from the side. Um, so I'm going to play this video. What this shows is on the left is the new enhanced. That's how you change the filter with all new enhanced units. The middle is the retrofit solutions. That's side access that we can put on anything that's installed today. And on the right is the traditional way. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll put this on the, on the clock here, but you can see again, that new one on the left, there's those two screws that are way up top in the front that uh, hinges down, stays on that hinge. We're gonna switch that filter. Um, again, because that's an enhanced unit, the moment that filter clicks in, the light goes green. Um, up on top there, put, put that back up, two screws in the front and we're done. And so that's now the new way to change the filter. And you basically, with a 6,000 gallon filter, have to do that one time a year. So now you have 39 seconds of maintenance throughout the entire year. No light changes, no other filters, you're done. On the left, you can, or in the middle, you can kind of see, I'll back this up for just a, a second. On the middle, you can see 
you just take those screws off four screws of right on the side that little panel pops off and these are all vandal resistant screws so they cannot you know they're, they're star screw, uh, screws that filter goes in you pop that panel back up and you go in you can see on the right you got to take that entire thing off from the bottom change the filter now we got to put this whole thing back up we got to lay on our back i mean I'm, i know i'm preaching to the choir <laughs> Um, and try to get these screws planted from the bottom while you're holding this up and trying to not make it fall on your head and get the whole thing aligned. And so that's, there's a, that's what happens today on the right. We can retrofit that with the middle or provide on new units with the enhanced that drop down. So we're making that easier. Uh, eventually I get it. You'll just have to trust me. Um, and so as we think about the different options, you know, folks have in terms of maintenance, you know, today, right, 3,000 gallon filter and that traditional shroud, you're going to change twice a year. It might take up to 30 minutes to do that each time. Um, two 3,000 gallon filters is about $150. So you're going to spend an hour in maintenance doing this twice there. If you go to the Easy FMK, you go from, you know, five to 30 minutes to two. If you go to the 6,000 gallon filter, you're going from two changes to one. And the drop down, you're taking even more time out. Now, the great thing is, is that 6,000 gallon filter, while it's double the capacity, it's not double the cost. And so over 6,000 gallons, getting one 6,000 versus two 3,000 actually saves time and money. And you don't have to change it as often. So these solutions of better filter access and longer lasting filters is a great way to improve your maintenance. Um, you know, we talked about kind of, you know, vandalism. We do have vandal resistant bottle fillers um, with more mechanical, um, less electronics, better build, you know, more stainless, less plastic um, alcoves or different uh, materials. And so for vandal resistant options, you know, we do have great well-built ones that have been tested against a lot of those, um, those issues and have been shown to perform. Um, you know, this is something uh, we call this the, the puck plate, but basically it's a retrofit, something new we developed um, for some, um, you know, schools that have the old school Haas, you know, 1311 uh, uh, drinking fountain. You can see at the bottom here on the right, but they want to put, you know, they, they're, they're being asked for bottle fillers. And so this basically just is designed to click or basically slide behind that. You don't have to replumb it. You don't need power. Um, you basically just click this in to the uh, the water there. And then now mechanically, this also is get, gives you a bottle filler option. So you're not just using this fountain, but you don't have to tear it down. You don't have to rip it out, put a whole new unit. You can retrofit this uh, unit on top of here, which provides you that bottle filler option. So again, quick, easy, effective way to give bottle filling um, options to individuals without having you know to do a whole lot of uh, construction, replumbing, bring in power, what, what have you. Um, you know, the other new one is we've also get customers that have kind of that, that double um, bowl drinking fountain that want a bottle filler. This is one unit that basically goes right over the top of all that still with the two drinking fountains, but now with this um, uh, uh, bottle filler, we've seen these setups before that bottle filler sticks out. So if you're now on that bottom bowl and you're going to drink, you're gonna bang your head on that bottle filler, right? And so this is now recessed where it allows functionality of all of this to just basically go over the top or to, to basically fit, fill the void of where that is today with a recess option that's all sort of one piece. Um, so really good option for those situations where you have something like this today, but wanna kind of improve that. You know, the other thing, so you, you might be looking at me and saying, hey, Scott, is this filtered or not? I need filtered water we can really filter anything with a water line. So we have retrofit kits that work on any single thing with a water line. Again, you can get back to your one skew with that and your stock one filter with anything. So um, you think about this old school porcelain bubbler, right? Uh, it's on a brick wall. I don't want to rip that down. I don't want to do an asbestos survey, but I need it filtered because, you know, I'm being asked to. We can maintain that and put filtration in line with that unit or this classroom sink bubbler combo underneath there, there's a, there's a uh, filter box. Um, there's really kind of two options you have. You can do this just very basically with a bracket, our filter and some water lines. We recommend this where it's in a protected environment. It's in a teacher's lounge. It's locked in a cabinet. 
it's behind the cafeteria, um, you know, food prep area. It's not going to get messed with. All you need is a bracket, a water line, a filter, and you're basically getting the exact same high quality filtration that we offer in anything. What's on the right here, the exact same concept, but in a vandal resistant box. Um, so built in here with um, vandal proof screws. Again, you can see on the wall here how what that looks like. The nice thing about this is on this enhanced one over on the right, that blue screen that gets through the window is actually a digital counter of gallons remaining of the filter. So it's not green, yellow, red. It would say 912 gallons, 911 gallons, 910 gallons, all the way down to zero. So that gives you precise gallons uh, remain within that filter. And again, that can apply to anything with a water line. You can get filtered um, with these retrofit kits. Um, another view at it, again, sort of mounted inside, um, some, some John Guest fittings. Um, we, we actually can do this in different types of fittings, threaded or push fit, um, it, and, and provides kind of that quick, uh, you know, filtration retrofit to, uh, to anything. This is programmable so we can get different types of filters and get that kind of, uh, that analog counter dialed in nicely. Um, you know, different ways to retrofit things like, you know, recess bubblers um, to, to, to provide that. Um, you know, other retrofit options, right? You kind of look at here, what we have that really incorporates the need or the demand for bottle fillers with the bowls and the drinking fountains, different options we have for different um, configurations and plumbing that, that you all might have uh, installed today. Um, so just talking about a couple other quick things before uh, specifically on, on the filters themselves, but, you know, classroom sink filtration kits, right? So, you know, the, the, um, the, the faucet and the little side bubbler, again, you know, putting that filter underneath that goes to all of that is, is we're seeing a lot of right now because, you know, with the pier, the Brita like twist on for the faucets, um, that doesn't really help your bubbler. Um, it's, they break a lot. Um, it's not protected. They have to be changed a lot. Some of those are a hundred gallons versus 3000 gallons. And so, you know, we kind of provide and are talking to our customers about putting this down below this at the main water line that serves both these fixtures and needs to be basically maintained once a year and it's protected. And then there's no, there's no issue with, you know, turning that off or possibly having it unfiltered. Every single ounce of water that comes up to that fixture area has gone through that filter. So there's no kind of ambiguity of is this filtered or not. It's the only source coming up from that protected box um, that's, again, maintained probably once a year. Um, the other thing is we have a great faucet uh, that's specifically designed for filtration. It's a two-in-one faucet. What does two-in-one mean? Basically, you can get both filtered and unfiltered water from one fixture. So I tell people today, and it's it's can be used in homes and teachers' lounges and different areas. But you know, I have this in my home in my kitchen. And if if you want filtration in your kitchen today, you you really have two options. You either filter everything going to your faucet, you put a three stage filtration system in, then you're washing dishes, whatever you're just kind of blowing through filters, or you drill a hole and you put that side beverage filler in, and you have that filter just for drinking. Now you have a little bit of clutter. This is both concepts in one. So the two in one allows you with the handle to pull unfiltered or filtered water through this one device. There's two independent waterways, two openings, and two basically functions to get the, the one way. If you look underneath here, it's a traditional faucet in that it pulls down. It has a stream, it's got a spray, but then underneath here, this little hole here is where you get your filtered water. This right here is your traditional water can see on the right of the slide and how that works mechanically is pretty cool so if you look underneath this sink right you have your hot and your cold line if i'm pulling with the you can look at the handle on the left if i'm pulling unfiltered water that hot and that cold goes straight up and out through the unfiltered section if i go for filtered water the cold line here it actuates at this t and it diverts water through the filter and up through the filtered spout. So really this handle is deciding whether the cold water goes up traditionally or through the filter and through the filtered portion of this one fixture. Um, we do this with PFOS filtration now. So again, I 
This is my house with PFAS filtration. I'm washing dishes. My son says, can I have some water to drink? I say, sure, close it, come down. All of a sudden you have unlimited PFAS lead-free filtered water in this one two-in-one device. And if you look at kind of the slide he here, it does have a small indicator light at its base, which will go red after a year, which basically um, indicates to change the filter. So this can be used in a lot of different settings where people want filtered water. They have a faucet today and you can install this very easily and you can have that two in one function versus just filtering everything to a faucet um, and having to maintain it more often. This allows you to kind of uh, efficiently use filtration. So, you know, we talk about our filters. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of great things about them. Number one, these are the most powerful, compact um, uh, filters on the market, um, meaning they're small but mighty. So some of our competitors have two bigger filters to do what we do in, in one, you know, nine inch filter that's about the width of a soda can. Um, this is a 6,000 gallon filter, right? Not that large, um, fits almost my hand, not, not you know, easy to deal with. Um, we have the chips on there that automatically reset on those, those P units and it's a quarter turn install. So kind of these large wings here, it's not threaded where you have a cross connection. You literally, it's quarter turn, it locks in and you're good to go. Um, you know, we talked about the enhanced, but I think it's important for everyone to understand we really have two different drinking fountain platforms and that kind of affects filtration. So we have a standard bottle filler and we have an enhanced. And you know it just by looking right at it. There's no, you don't have to look at a serial number or date. If you have the gray racetrack with the lights on the left and the counter on the right, that's a standard unit. The center set blue is an enhanced unit. Why does that matter? For standard units on the left here, that mechanically is designed to go from green to red after 3,000 gallons. Our number one selling filter by a landslide is a 3,000 gallon filter. So mechanically, that is a 3,000 gallon uh, basically sensor, 3,000 gallon filter, works out great. With the enhanced, one of the reasons it's enhanced is because it's got those added electronics that read the filter chip and it will keep the green, it'll change the green lights accordingly to that filter. So the enhance is where you get full value out of your 6,000 and can keep that green light on twice as long and have half the maintenance. So in other words, if you put a 6,000 gallon filter in a standard unit, it will filter, it will be safe, it will work. It will go red after 3,000 gallons. So you're not getting the full value out of it. If you put a 6,000 gallon filter in the enhanced, it will know and it will keep it on for 6,000 gallons, all that green light. And you'll have half the maintenance and half the calls about a pesky red light. Um, you know, we really have three core commercial filters. This is the beauty of it is that you don't have a ton of SKUs. I don't have a big lineup. I really have three. I have a 3,000 gallon lead filter. I have a 6,000 gallon lead filter. And I have a PFAS filter. That PFAS filter is rated to 2,250 gallons. And I'll, I'll talk about why when we get to... Uh, a slide specifically on that. But those are sort of your options. The way I think about this is your standard lead filter is our core, right? That's 6,000 gallon lead filter. It's the longest lasting, the least maintenance and the lowest total cost of ownership. The PFAS filter is the highest performing, most contaminants removed, you know, best water quality. Because with the PFAS filter, it does PFAS in addition to lead, not a substitute. So you don't have to choose. It does both in addition to not uh, just PFAS and, and not lead. Um, we don't have to spend a ton of time on this, but basically just again, highlighting the 6,000 gallon filter, simply the best in terms of value, maintenance, everything. You're not going to spend as much money on filters and you're going to spend less time maintaining them. Um, the PFAS filter, you know, one of the... Uh, one of the things that makes this unique, right, is when I go and certify this filter with NSF for NSF compliance for whatever we remove, if I'm saying I want this to be a lead filter, I got to show that this filter took lead below five parts per billion. That's the standard. Now, ours goes below one, but we hit that threshold of five parts per billion. With PFAS, the threshold I have to show this takes PFAS down to is 250 times lower than for lead. So 
it's in the parts per trillion is where PFAS has to be to get this NSF certification. So when I say there's not a lot of filters in the market because it's difficult to get there, it's because we have to perform this filter at a level 250 times better than lead in terms of where it goes to. The way to think about filters and how they operate is inside of here, there's a carbon block. There's a tiny, there's all these tiny holes drilled into it to increase surface area. Water starts to come in this filter that's got lead, cysts, sediment all in it. And basically that carbon block is like a sponge. It starts out dry, it starts out empty. As water comes through here, this carbon block starts to attach and absorb lead and metals and sediment and, and basically take them on. So it's like a dry sponge empty that now starts to get metal, metal, metal in it, takes it out of the water. Now you have clean water. Eventually that sponge fills up and it's full of lead. It's full of metals. You can't, that, that, that sponge can't absorb anything more. That's when you change a filter. You know, that's why we say it's rated for 3000 gallons. Because after 3000 gallons, it's probably full and you got to put a new one in to start absorbing the lead again. You know, with the PFAS, right, it's a lower capacity because it's taking on more. It's taking not only lead, but PFAS out of the water. It's going to fill up quicker because it's leaving you cleaner water. So, you know, that's a, a way to think about um, that particular filter. Um, you know, I think just, you know, we, we have a couple slides here left and then we can, uh, any questions, you know, happy to address. Um, you know, the thing we think about specs and designs is, you know, making sure that filter access is easy. That's the number one thing we hear about is filter access, the lights, the maintenance. With this uh, enhanced, you know, there's basically three things that make it easier for you all. Drop down shroud, right? No longer having to get your back, no longer having to line things up, just drop it down. It's ability to take on a 6,000 gallon filter to increase the longevity of it and, and decrease the maintenance and that automatic filter reset. Um, so again, there's no catches in that 39 seconds. That's it. That's from starting to uh, undo the first screw to putting the last screw in. You don't have to dig around for resets. It happens automatically. And so thinking about longevity of filters, filter access, lights, all these things, you know, really kind of improve um, and push spec to kind of make facilities maintenance easier um, down the road. Um, you know, we talked about the bottle fillers, right? So, you know, I, I think this will be more useful when you guys get the PDF. Um, the, the top line here is what now is that quick filter change, um, the filtered faucet, the two in one we talked about, the SKUs here, this EF3000 VRBMC is that filter box with the counter. And then the EZFMK is the side access, that retrofit shroud that allows you to change the filter from the side just by just removing that side panel versus taking the whole thing down. Um, so I always kind of wrap up talking about a few pillars in terms of our platform, our filtration platform. Um, you know, best in class filtration, we think, okay, you know, most powerful filter in the market for what it does in its size. Um, you know, we hear a lot from sustainability that you're leaving behind not a lot for what it's accomplishing versus some of the other filters that, that get uh, disposed of. Um, we have all the top, you know, gold standard for, for, for certifications, NSF IATMO certified for everything we claim longest lasting 6,000 PFAS. Um, only one in bottle fillers that does PFAS as a filter. So first in the industry there. Um, everything changed annually. All filters can fit in any device. You know, so that compatibility of those three core, um, you know, LK filters, you don't have to deal with a whole lot. If you just want the 3,000 gallon filter for everything, you're done with one SKU. Um, ability to upgrade, you know, so we talked a lot about changes and easy changes. Filtered faucet, you know, for different drinking water applications. And then, you know, easy use within our systems, automatic reset, quarter turn, filter change easier, lowest total cost of ownership, and, you know, least maintenance with longer lasting. So I think just in closing, right, you know, we work with schools, facilities, so we have an education team that all day is calling on schools to help them with these solutions. And so to the extent you have um, a unique, you know, setup and you want to retrofit something or a new solution, let us know, right? We can come on site, do an evaluation, work together what solutions might work with that. We're happy to do that. We do that all day, every day. Um, we can really help consult with you on drinking water. Um, obviously, that is the core of what we do. That's the core of what, what I do from a filtration standpoint. We have a whole team on the dispensing um, drinking water side. So, you know, let's, you can see kind of what's possible. Some of these were designed specifically for situations. 
we think like that and think about like what we can do to help our customers to kind of achieve, I think, this end state. And I think the last thing is around, um, you know, I'll talk about ESSER funds just briefly. Um, we've seen a lot of schools that still have remaining ESSER funds. And so just as a reminder, ESSER funds was a big campaign that the government did in COVID that schools could utilize to basically reopen eventually hygienically. Most of the money went to um, air purification systems and hygienic uh, fixtures and touchless, um, you know, basically different, different stuff. You fast forward three years, um, they're still available. Most schools actually still have them. We have a database of billions of dollars that are still unused, but they're expiring in three months. So in September, they're done. If you don't use it, you lose it. And it's getting a little bit late to think about construction and pulling permits and getting labor and contractors to use these ESSER funds for anything substantial, to be frank. So what we've talked to customers about, we're actually getting a lot of good feedback is use your ESSER funds to stock up on filters before they expire. You can buy two or three years worth of filters with your ESSER funds today, which frees up your operating budget for the next couple of years, Right. Again, government funded money, available, expiring. These don't go bad. They ship nicely in boxes. They can go in a storage closet easily. If you don't wanna take them all, let us know and we'll ship them to you um, when you want them over time. But utilizing those funds today to buy a few years really frees up your operating budget before. And, and it's the kind of easiest way to quickly use them and something you were gonna spend money on. Um, so that's sort of a maybe, maybe a closing thought and opportunity for you all. Um, appreciate everyone's time. Um, I, I know I went through that a little bit quickly because there's a lot to cover. So if there's anything anyone's got questions on, go back over again or cover, you know, I'm happy to, uh, to address any of those. Thank you, Scott. Um, and I want to thank everybody for your time and attention to this really important issue. Um, Scott and I were speaking ahead of time prior to going live and I talked about the fact fact that I have a teenager in a public school system in Wisconsin, and it's something that we talk about a lot. Um, she brings her, her, you know, stainless bottle with her every day, and it's a really important issue. So thank you. Uh, and I'd like to thank everybody for some questions. Scott, there are more than a few. So I'm going to start right. at the top and we'll get to as many as I can. And also just know for everybody on our call today, all of these questions will also be provided to Scott and his team. If we can't get to everything, in the live space, we'll make sure that they see those questions as a follow-up. So I'm gonna start with Raymond's question. He's talking about larger buildings that they're managing and there's difficulty keeping the water fresh. Chlorine residuals get too low, they have to flush water in areas and they wanna test for chlorine at the spaces where the water is consumed, the, the bottle fillers, electric water coolers. Um, these typically have water filters on them and that removes the chlorine so they feel like that testing isn't effective. Is there a way to provide a pre-filter pre test port or do you have any re recommendations of how to get that, that testing done in that situation? Yeah, there, there wouldn't be, I'm not aware of, you know, around the bottle itself to, to dump the water pre-filter. Everything's kind of tight and, and plumbed in there. We don't want a right. lot of access points for leakage, but what I'd recommend is going to a nearby fixture you know, that's, that's not, that's not filtered, um, a sink, a faucet and, and testing at that point. But, but yeah, we, we, we don't provide kind of that clean out or, or that, uh, that, that relief valve, um, at least I'm aware of within the bottle filler, just because you have one application for yes, but then a lot of things can go wrong as you kind of allow that, um, you know, to, to be open in, in ways. Yeah. So that option is a good one to get that testing done without disturbing the ecosystem that you've just talked about. That's so vital. That's great. Um, I think you addressed this question from John Scott, but let's go back to it. He's asking about the filters being added into older models after the fact. So we're going to talk a little bit about how all of those uh, pieces play together. Yeah. So so an, a, a non-filtered bottle filler bubbler, in terms of the integration into the unit, um, that, that you wouldn't be able to twist it in inside the unit. But this is where the, um, and I'm trying to find the slide. This is where the retrofit kits are, are easily kind of implemented to put yeah. adjacent to it, underneath it, um, in line with it, just to kind of get that incoming water line. You're basically building a filtration, uh, uh, you know, bracket and port next to it because that's not necessarily integrated into your unit. Okay. All right. 
Um, Wayne's got a couple of questions. I think he's looking at big picture, filtration, water, quality, all those things. And he's asking, um, does the filter change the water to alkaline? What What's the transition that you see there? And then he's asking a little bit about hydrogen water. That might be something more on a commercial market, but I thought we could talk to it here. Yeah, so, and I know there's another question about what we do. So maybe I'll just talk about the filter performance. Sure. Um, you know, th this isn't today um, designed to change water to alkaline, like some of the, maybe the, the countertop units that have right. different alkaline properties or pH properties or sparkling and this and that. You know, it's basically taking out um, lead, cysts, chlorine, uh, chlorine taste odor, um, class one particulate, um, sediment and PFAS and microplastics. You know, so we've sort of identified that the three, you know, the three major ones, again, lead PFAS microplastics, that's from a health perspective, right. the, um, you know, chlorine taste odor particulates is more of an aesthetic thing, uh, but that's sort of the focus of the core filter itself. Um, so we don't have plans today to kind of add different alkaline, um, you know, uh, um, properties to it, but, but it is something we've thought about in terms of enhancing them in the future to be able to put in different sorts of properties in the water that people seek out. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Randy's asking about the enhanced filler, wondering, does it identify the PFAS? as well as, uh, you know, yes. changing after that 2250 gallon. So there's an yep. actual designation. That's great. Yeah. So, so all that, just like that, I mean, all three of our filters, I'll, I'll show you a PFAS filter, which is, which is right here. All three of our filters still have those, um, those, those chips on the back underneath the sticker. So this is our PFAS filter. Um, it okay. will have that chip that says 2250 and that will talk to the enhanced to basically keep the lights on. Um, according to the capacity. So anything you put in that enhanced unit will have these chips on the back. The trick is, is that you got to make sure that it's facing one direction. So this can be 180 degrees one or the other. If yeah. you put the filter in, the, the light doesn't reset. Likely it's facing the wrong way and you have to just turn it so that it can talk to that unit and, and identifies those chips. Okay, wonderful. Um, somebody's asking about bottled water versus filtered bottle fillers. Do you, are there studies? Is there data? How do you guys look towards those kinds of comparisons? I imagine you're getting consumer questions. I imagine as more parents and stakeholders enter schools, they're asking these questions too. How do you respond to those? Yeah. So, so, you know, um, I'd say a couple of things I'd say, you know, with, with the kind of the, the new microplastics, you know, concern, um, mm -hmm. you know, bottled water can contain lots of microplastics. Our filters actually take it out of the water. The other thing is, you know, if you look at the 6,000 gallon filter, um, this is in lieu of 48,000 16 ounce plastic bottles. And so, you know, just from a sustainability environmental impact, you can have this one filter in my hand or I can fill this up with 48,000 single use plastic bottles. Um, and this is, this filter costs about $120 for the year for, you know, sort of a hundred students or whatever that bottle filler. Um, what it replaces at you know forty eight thousand, um, even if a, a, a bottle of water is uh, twenty five cents each, right? That's yeah. that's about twelve thousand dollars versus one hundred twenty dollars. So it's about one one hundredth the cost to effectively go through. Not a lot, and then you don't have to throw it out. You don't have to take right. all those bottles and dispose of them. It's all integrated, and you know it's it's unlimited, right? It, it's just using buildings water and filtering it versus setting that up getting them in place. So we've seen a ton of, I would say, good feedback around that kind of total cost of ownership around and the sustainability part about it as well. Yeah, it certainly does. You can automatically, you know, my, I started adding things up in my head, just thinking of that $48,000 uh, number. That's a stunning number. Um, Ray's asking about changing filters and whether or not you need to shut off the water when doing that, or is there an automatic detect and water flow stop? So because this is recorded, I will tell you, you should <laughs> shut off the water. No, it, it's, it's, look, it's, it's one of these things where best case is shut off the water. There is a shut, there is a shut off mechanism in the head that when you take the filter out, it will close. And so I've seen it done many times. I've done it where I've changed filters without shutting off the water. It works, but you know, our kind of, as a corporation, our, <laughs> the official, guidance is to shut the water off but um 
I, I can tell you kind of off the record, I, I know that it works without it. Best practice, shut the water off. But if you don't do it, it can work. Is okay. maybe the, the way to leave that. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Brian had the same question and then had a follow-up question. If, yeah. the filter, if the filter is removed from the housing to repair a leak, when you're putting that filter back in, does the chip go reset or does it stay at that same uh, level of gallonage recording? Yeah, so it's pretty amazing. So I'm glad you asked that question because yeah. just, just to kind of talk through the technology of this. So when you're using the filter, it's actually writing, writing back to the chip of the usage. And so you basically have this chip that's a real-time indication of how many gallons are left on it. So I'll give you a different, I'll, I'll answer your question with a different example. This is a 6,000 gallon filter. I put it into a unit. I use 4,000 gallons. I take it out. I go to a different unit and put it in. After 2,000 gallons, it will go red. It knew it had 2,000 gallons left, even in that new unit. I go take this out and put it in a new unit. After that 2,000 gallons, it will never go green because it doesn't have any gallon capacity left on it. So these are smart enough where it's writing back to the chip in real time, it's current capacity, and that's what's communicating to even a different bottle filler. So yes, if you take this out to do something, you put it back in, it will resume where it left off with that capacity. Oh, that's fantastic. All right, uh, Scott, I literally lost track of time and we're coming up at the top of the hour. So I'm gonna let everyone know if we didn't get to your question, please know we're gonna get this over to Scott and his team. They can take a look. And if there's any um, follow-up, they will, they will make sure that that happens. Um, Scott, I'm gonna ask you for just a quick takeaway and I'm actually gonna pose this in form of a question from me to you. You had talked about, you know, your Zern team can get on site at these schools, at these facilities, take a look, run an audit and really walk through options when it comes to this technology. Um, so as, as, our, as our attendees today consider that opportunity, in your experience, what has been the biggest takeaway? What do our attendees you know, what should they expect and what can they consider as some of those big aha moments that they might experience when they actually run through the technology options with someone from your team? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, hopefully, hopefully everyone maybe learns something today about what we have to offer, whether it's filter longevity, better maintenance options, better retrofit options. You know, our team has that knowledge intimately known. And so, you know, I think what they could expect or the advantage is we come in with that entire breadth of knowledge of, I mean, there's a lot of things I didn't show today, right? Just from the sake of slides and time, but we know that you may not. And so we look at things and we can kind of recall all the options we have in terms of sliding a puck plate behind, you know, a bubbler or, you know, retrofitting, um, you know, a, a double, a double with kind of a new option we have just in terms of a plate or the bevel plate behind the new enhanced. So you don't have to change the wall or anything. People know about some of that. They may not know about all of it, but we have that breadth of knowledge where we can look at problems. We can look at situations and setups, and we can figure out the best solution. Not only the best solution from a installation perspective, but the best solution from a um, maintenance perspective. I'll give you an example real quickly: is that if we look at something in the in the entryway to the school, or by the locker room, or by the gym, we might recommend something that can you know handle the six thousand gallon filter, which is the enhanced, because you get high usage. If you look at something in, you know, the third story library wing, um, with all due respect, to library, we might say you don't need the 6,000 here. You need the 3,000 just because of the usage and kind of the setup of where it might be. And so, you know, I would say the combination of our product knowledge, but also having done this and knowing kind of flow patterns and applications, really that collaboration around the best solution is not only from an installation perspective, a cost perspective, we talked about always always balancing maintenance and procurement but also the you know installation cost maintenance we can kind of take those all into consideration and give you likely the best uh solution to retrofit or upgrade or um, get into kind of some of the programs we talked about that sounds like a great opportunity thank you scott and and i think we've like i said we've we've gotten to the end of our event today um, so I want to thank you, Scott, again, for a great presentation. I want to thank Zern LK for an amazing sponsorship and support of this incredible message, this important message. And I'd like to thank our attendees for being a part of uh, our event today and asking those amazing questions. So just a reminder, everybody, you're going to receive an email shortly with a PDF copy of Scott's slides today and a link to that online assessment that you can take, pass, and get an additional CEU certificate for. So again, everybody, thanks for your time. Thanks for your attention to this important subject. 
And with that, we're going to conclude today's webcast. Thank you.